My lesson today doesn't have anything to do with mothers in particular. Uh, it has to do with hymns, hymns that we sing. We have a song book that has something like 900 songs in it. Most of us are familiar with many of them and not too familiar with many of them. But the ones that we are familiar with, even some of those have some interesting phrases in them that we might not really have thought about much, and when we're singing it, maybe we don't really know what we're singing. So the basis of our study today is 1 Corinthians 14, 15, which says this. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. So what this is telling us is that when we're singing, it's not just a happy you know, thing that we're doing just to sing a song. We need to be understanding what it is we're singing. Because really, if you think about it, singing is just a form, really, of prayer. It's just kind of set to music. Most of the hymns that we sing, the lyrics are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and so they're easy to understand. But some of them have some phrases that may be not familiar to us in this day and age. Uh, because what you have to remember is that some of these hymns, I always find it interesting if you pull up a hymn, it'll give you the date the hymn was written and you know, who it was written by and some other little information there. Many of these hymns were written back in the 1700s or 1800s and they have stayed with us for hundreds of years. So the way they talked back in those days uh, might be a little different than the way we talk today. Also, some of the songs are a little more poetic. You know, they're kind of like poetry set to music. So they use words that we might not use in everyday conversation. So I have a list here of, of quite a few of them. We'll see how many we can get through here. They're not in any particular order, so let's just start with number one. I believe we sang this song last week. Night with Evan Pinion. The first verse of that song is Night with Evan Pinion brooded o'er the veil. Boy, there's a lot of phrases in there that might not ring to our 21st century ears here. Eben. You might have figured that one out. It's a kind of an abbreviated version of the word ebony, which is a dark, very dark tropical wood. So really, eben can be used to refer to anything that's very dark or black. Pinion is an interesting word. It refers to a wing or the outer end of a wing. So what in the world would that have to do with a Bible song? Well, in literature, it refers to like the entire wing and the lyricist is portraying this knight as having black wings as Jesus prayed in the garden. Brooded means hovered over or loomed over. Or is a poetic version of the word over. And veil is a poetic word that means valley. And in this case refers to Kidron Valley. Which uh, Jesus was near when they ascended to the Mount of Olives and where Garden of Gethsemane was. So if we put it all together, night with ebon pinion brooded over the veil, it's trying to paint a picture here of a very dark event. And that was the event of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, going through that mental agony that he did, knowing that his crucifixion was in the very near future. Uh, this interpretation is kind of uh, also mentioned in John 18, 1 there, when it says, Jesus had spoken these words. He went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. So I guess if you can picture this in your mind, it's a very dark, not only dark, maybe physically, night, but dark emotionally for Jesus. It's a very interesting, uh, very interesting way of expressing that. Another song, song number 500 in your book. O thou fount of every blessing, 
has a phrase in verse 2 that says, Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come. Okay, has anybody used the word hither lately? Probably not. Has anybody walked around raising their Ebenezer lately? Okay, no hands are going up, I wonder why. To get a little better uh, background of that, let's read through 1 Samuel 7.10 there. Now as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to the battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day, and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel went out to Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and drove them back as far as beth -car. Then Samuel took a stone, set it up between Mizpah and Shen, and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come any more into the territory of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. So the word Ebenezer literally means stone of help. So this was kind of a monument, if you will, that the people could remember this victory over the Philistines by. What does that have to do with us today? When we raise our Ebenezer, it's a way of expressing our gratitude to God to what he has done for us. None of us have probably been in battles that God has rescued us from or, or you know, given us success in, but we've had our personal battles, I'm sure. We've had instances where we needed God's help and he was there to help us. So when I say I'm raising my Ebenezer, what we're really saying is I'm acknowledging God's blessing and God's care throughout my life. It's a very good sentiment to remember not only when we're singing the song, but throughout our whole lives. A point about this, I don't know if anybody has ever, this is a little, just a little bit of an aside here, but I don't know if anybody's ever taken the time to look at the index of the, of the songbook. There are about four or five different indexes. One of them is, you know, just the name of the song, if you happen to know the song and you need to look it up. But there's also some other interesting songs in here. There, there's a metrical index which probably doesn't mean anything to anybody who's not a musician, but if you know the tune, you can actually look it up by the meter of the tune. Pretty interesting. There's an alphabetical list, but the one that I find the most interesting is there's a scriptural list. So, I don't know what's on page, there's no page number, but it's way in the back, it's called scriptures, and it, it's an interesting index because it shows all of the scriptural references that all of these hymns have. And it goes on for pages and pages. The interesting thing about that is that all of these, or most of these hymns, are based on a specific scripture. And that scripture is kind of set to music and elucidated a little bit. So just so that you know, when you're singing, you're really quoting the Bible in a lot of cases. Let's move on to number three. Song number 234, Higher Ground. This has become kind of our theme song for this year because of our theme this year is Seeking Higher Ground. So we've sung this song on a number of occasions and probably will continue to sing it throughout the year. There's one little phrase in here that the last time I was singing it, I wondered what it meant, so I went and looked it up. It's in the chorus, and it says, Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. What's a table land? Yeah, a plateau. What did you say, a mesa? Okay. It's a broad, expansive level area like a plateau or a mesa. So heaven's table land is a poetic way of describing where we will be when we get to heaven. You could think of it being on a higher plateau maybe above all of the things that we have to deal with nowadays, temptations, cares, trials, tribulations, all that sort of thing. It could also reflect the vastness of heaven. You know, a plateau, if you get out there, you can just see to the horizon, basically. There's nothing, nothing in your way. It's kind of like when we go to the ocean here and look out. It's just a vast uh, 
plateau there. So heaven is going to be a great place for us to be where we can be on another plateau. I'm looking forward to that because sometimes I'm not really thrilled about the plateau we're on right now. But anyways, that's right. Yeah, more like a valley. Song number four. We don't sing this song very much. And I think maybe the reason is because it was written by Martin Luther. And we think that it might be a Lutheran song or something. But it's quite a well-known song. A Mighty Fortress is Our God. We've probably all heard the song, if not having sung it. There's a verse in there that says, A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Bulwark is not a word I have in my general vocabulary, but there's a figurative uh, meaning of the word and there's a uh, physical meaning of the word. The physical meaning of it is it's a solid wall-like structure raised for defense, like a big wall. A seat like they used to build around their cities back in biblical times for protection. Could also be used to refer to a rampart, a seawall, you know, any big strong wall that's going to be able to keep things out that you don't want in. A figuratively can be used to just reference a strong support or protection. So God is our protection, and in that frame of mind. He's a bulwark, never failing. Psalm 28, 7 makes that quite clear. It says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices. With my song, I will praise him. So he is my strength and my shield. I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't feel very strong, maybe spiritually. Uh, and so I need to rely on God because God is strong. And God will help us when we ask for his help. Number five, there's a phrase in two different hymns, song number nine there, A Wonderful Savior, and song 557, Rock of Ages. They both talk about being hidden or in the cleft of the rock. In the first song in there, it says, He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. In the Rock of Ages, it says, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. So it's basically kind of saying the same thing in a different order. What is a cleft? Simply a space or an opening made in the rock, a crack or a crevice, you can think of it. And what does this mean? Where does, where does this idea come from? It comes from Exodus 13, or 33, 18. Let's read it together. It says, and he, and this is Moses, said, please show me your glory. He's talking to God. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. This is God speaking. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face. For no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me. And you shall stand on the rock. And it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. I find it interesting that some people claim that they've seen God or heard from God or something like that. This is a pretty strong verse that tells us that cannot be so. No man can see the face of God and live to tell about it. Colossians 3.2 makes it sort of a, a New Testament version of this. And it says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So as Moses was hidden in the cleft of the rock, we are hidden in Christ. I found an interesting commentary here. I don't know if it's valid or not, but it was interesting. And I, I guess it could be from John Gill, and it says, one of the clefts made by smiting it, through which the waters gushed out for the relief of the Israelites and their flocks, we are told to this day on, this mount, on the summit of Mount Sinai, it is perceived a large chasm in the rock, said to be the cave where Moses himself hid from God, where the glory of the Lord passed before him. Now this cleft may be an emblem of Christ, 
as crucified, smitten, wounded, and slain, who was smitten by the law and the justice of God, as this rock was smitten by the rod of Moses, and had gashes and wounds made in him, like the clefts of a rock being pierced with the nails and the spear. So he's kind of making this correlation here between Jesus and the rock. Is that valid? I mean, it sounds like it could be. Um, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting comment at any rate. So as God hid Moses in the cleft of the rock, he provides a refuge for our souls when we're hidden in Christ. I don't know if you ever notice who the writer of the hymns are, but there's a great number of hymns, I didn't really count them up, probably at least a dozen, I think even more, that were written by the person that wrote uh, A Wonderful Savior, and her name is Fanny Crosby. She's got a very interesting story. She was blind for most of her life uh, due to a surgical mishap. She was having some problems with her eyes, and I don't know, back in those days, they didn't have LASIK surgery and all the stuff we got today. They kind of botched up some surgery, and basically she was blind for the rest of her life. Uh, she supported herself teaching at a blind school, and she had a lot of uh, dear and close friends around the world. And she really wrote thousands of hymns. Many of them are still sung today, and many of them are in that very songbook that we use. But what I find interesting about her is a quote that she said, which I have written down there. She said, it seemed intended by the blessed providence of God that I should be blind all my life. And I thank him for the dispensation. If perfect earthly sight were offered me tomorrow, I would not accept it. I might not have sung hymns to the praise of God if I had been distracted by the beautiful and interesting things about me. Wow. Talk about an attitude, huh? Man, most people that were blind would consider that a curse. She considered it a blessing and, in fact, wouldn't have wanted it any other way. I found that really inspiring. It's a great quote. Let's move on to the next song. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Verse 1 says, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. I never really thought too much about this when I was singing it. I always thought of a diadem being basically like a crown, but in fact, it's a little bit different. It's a cloth band or wrapping that would look something more like a turban that a king or a queen would wear to signify their royal authority. R rulers of the ancient Near East didn't wear gold rigid crowns as we think of crowns today, but rather cloth turbans worn around their head and decorated with various jewels and gems and such. The New Testament uses the Greek word for diadem only in the book of Revelation, which I think is interesting, and in those couple verses that I've mentioned there. And the New Testament also makes a pretty clear distinction between a diadem and a crown. So a crown was really a garland or a wreath that would be awarded to somebody for faithful service or for you know, some other auspicious event. Uh, such as, you know, Timothy, in, in the second Timothy, it mentions a crown of righteousness. But a diadem is always symbolized royal authority. That's the difference. So it's completely appropriate that Jesus would be wearing a diadem because of his royal authority at the right hand of God. So next time you sing that song, don't think of somebody wearing a crown, think of somebody wearing a turban with jewels around it. How do we know that Jesus has this royal authority? He told us. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So we know that Jesus is in charge, that he has authority over everything. Let's move on to song number 438. My hope is built on nothing less has a phrase in verse 1 that says, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. These words are written about 150 years ago, 
and it might be a little difficult for us to know exactly what the lyricist was referring to here. Some sources suggest that it might mean our earthly frames, our bodies, uh, that are so fragile and mortal and that we can't really put that much trust in. Others suggest it's a frame of mind that perhaps we can't even trust our own thinking. Psalm 103 uses the word. In verse 14 it says, For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. So in that case, it probably is referring to both of those, the physical frame as well as the frame of mind. Strong defines it, the word frame, as a couple different things, a form, a conception, a purpose, imagination, mind, work. So all of what we are could be considered our frame. It includes our bodies, our minds, our spirits. So when we sing, I do not trust the sweetest frame, we have to think of how we trust ourselves versus how we trust God. Should we trust this frame that is only going to be here for 80 or 90 years? Or should we trust God, who is eternal? That's a rhetorical question, but we all know the answer. We have to continually remind ourselves not to put so much trust in our earthly frames, but to put our trust in God and in Christ our Savior. Moving right along, Come Thou Almighty King. We sing this song quite often. A couple of phrases in there. Incarnate word. I don't know, I don't use the word incarnate very much. I've really only heard it used in religious uh, connotations. But what it really means is clothed with flesh or embodied in flesh. So the incarnate word is a reference to the word made flesh, which is Jesus. John 1.14 says it exactly that way. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So incarnate word reminds us that Jesus became flesh in order to take on our sins. I love the title, Ancient of Days. I don't know why I love it. There's just something about it that it sounds sort of neat to me. I don't know. I can't explain it. But this title of God is only referred to in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. So it's not a very common way to refer to God. But Barnes, in his commentary, says this. The phrase, Ancient of Days, is one that denotes an elderly or old person meaning who, he who is most ancient as to days, and is equivalent to the English, the eternal. So that's basically what it's trying to say. The ancient of days has been there forever, will be there forever, is eternal. It's a representation of one venerable in years, sitting down for the purposes of judgment. The appellation does not of itself denote eternity, but it's employed probably with a reference to the fact that God is eternal. So the ancient of days. And finally, the word sovereign. <clears throat> Anybody that lives over in the UK probably understands the word sovereign better than we do because they have a monarchy over there. But sovereign really for our purposes and for the purposes of this song really means supreme in power, the highest. Uh, having dominion over everything. In the case of God, he has dominion over the entire universe. It also means supreme or superior to all others. So God's up here somewhere. Everything else is a little bit under that. So when we sing sovereign majesty, we need to think about God as being the highest being in the universe. Here's another song. I believe we sang this one either last week or the week before it. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. And the balm of Gilead is also mentioned in song 124, Did You Think to Pray? So what is a balm in Gilead? Well, first of all, Gilead is a place just east of Jordan. It was famous for its healing ointments or balms made from the storax tree, which is uh, 
described in Genesis 37, 25 and Jeremiah 46, 11 there. When a person had a hurt or something that they needed, you know, help with, they would go to Gilead to get a balm to heal that. It might have been an infection, it might have been sore muscles, or whatever the case may be. But what does that have to do with us? Do we have a physical balm that we have to put on ourselves? No, the indication here is depicted in Jeremiah 8.22 there. He says, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people? So we're talking about not a physical need for a balm here. We're talking about a spiritual need. In this case, Jeremiah was grieving and weeping. He was very upset because of all the idolatrous practices of the people of those days that he was trying to preach to and they didn't want to listen to him and his warnings were just kind of going in one ear and out the other. They really weren't interested in changing. Uh, but the healing balm that he was pointing to eventually, though he may not have really understood it at that time, was Jesus. Think about it for a minute. What balm do we have now to take away our sins, to take away our sinful nature, our sinfulness? Do we have something we can rub on ourselves, to take it away? No. But we have Jesus, who died for our sins, and in doing that, was our balm in Gilead, took away those sins for us. It's interesting in Mark 2, 17 there, the verse I've written down there, when Jesus heard this, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So Jesus is telling us that that's the reason he came here, to be our balm, to call us sinners to repentance. And hopefully all of us have, have done that. So Jesus indeed is our balm, the remedy for sin that can bring us back to good spiritual health. And he's the only balm. I mean, no one else has the ability to take away our sin other than Jesus. And he did that through the blood that he shed on Calvary. So interesting little turn of phrase there. There is a balm in Gilead. There's a couple songs that mention something called the ransomed throng. And I don't like the word throng because every time I look at it, I want to say a different word. And if I did, I'd be very embarrassed. And some of you know what I'm talking about. But the ransomed throng. First of all, what is ransom? Most of us probably think of when we hear the ransom, we think of what? Like kidnapping, right? Somebody says... I've kidnapped your son and I'll return him if you give me a million dollars. So the ransom is a million dollars in order to rescue or get back that child. And in fact, that's what the word ransom means. Uh, Ron Driver and Briggs in their lexicon uh, say that it's defined as to redeem, rescue, or deliver. Webster has the more common definition of what we we're just talking about, of a price paid for the release of a prisoner or a captive. But in scripture, it's not talking about kidnapping. It's talking about the redemption from the bondage of sin and from the punishment to which sinners should be subjected uh, according to the divine law. So, the ransomed throng. A throng is a crowd or a multitude of people living in a close uh, close assemblage to each other. So a large gathering, a large group of people can be called a throng. So who, are, who is the ransomed throng? If I get through this lesson without saying that other word, I'm going to pat myself on the back. <laughs> Isaiah 35.10, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. And they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So when he's talking about Zion here, he's talking about the spiritual Zion. 
which to us, we think of heaven. Matthew 20, 28 also mentions it. It says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus was the ransom. He paid the ransom for us. So we are more or less off the hook, if you want to think of it that way, as far as the ransom goes. And we can look forward to being part of that ransomed throng in heaven. That's where we're all going to be together. It's a wonderful thing to look forward to. I don't know about you, but the tougher my life gets, the more I need to start thinking about heaven, because we can get so focused on every little thing that's happening right now that we kind of lose the bigger picture. So let's keep our eye on, on heaven. Song number 197, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. We kind of often sing this as an invitation song. And there's a phrase in there that says, Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Everybody probably it sounds familiar to everybody. But absolute sway was a little puzzler for me. I didn't know what that meant, so I looked it up. Sway means a controlling influence, a sovereign power, dominion, the ability to exercise influence or authority. One writer said this about the phrase. The phrase gives us a glimpse of the songwriter's desire to be completely controlled <clears throat> by the Spirit of God. So hold o'er my being absolute sway <clears throat> means that every moment, every choice, every thought, word, deed that we have would ideally be controlled by God alone. She didn't want to rely on her own fleshly sinful tendencies, but instead toward being a testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ within her. So basically we're asking God to be over us, to influence us, that everything we do will be according to God's will, that he would hold sway over our lives. I hope you all have a photographic memory so the next time we sing these songs you'll know exactly what you're singing. If not, you can fold this up and put it in your purse or your pocket or something. Song number 268. I gave my life for thee. We often sing this one right before the communion. And it has a phrase in there. The lyric says that, that, thou, might, that thou mightst ransomed be and quickened from the dead. Well, we've already talked about the ransom. We don't need to talk about that part. But what about quickened from the dead? The word quicken is not a word we use too often, unless we're talking about uh, some software package for doing our taxes, but it means to make alive, to revive, to cause to be enlivened, to, to stimulate. Look at 1 Peter 2.24 there. It says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. So the phrase is really driving home the idea that when Jesus died on the cross, because of that death, we can be brought back to eternal life after our own physical death. So that, I guess another way you could say it is that he died that we might live, which is not an original thought for me, but we read that in the Bible. So you're going to be quickened from the dead someday if you play your cards right. Let's move on to number 13. Song number 337, Is Thy Heart Right With God? A couple of phrases here. Have thine affections been nailed to the cross? Is thy heart right with God? Have you nailed your affections to the cross? What are affections? Normally we would think of affection as, as love for somebody, right? We have great affection for somebody. But it can also mean attachments, devotions, loves, passions, anything that we hold dear in our lives, anything that's important to us, and most importantly, anything that causes that thing to be more important than God in our lives. 
You know, we all know we're supposed to put God first in our lives to try to let everything be secondary to that. Sometimes we fail in that. I know I certainly do. And so what it's telling us here is that all of those things that we hold dear to us, and these are not necessarily just inanimate things, but they could be people as well. Anything. Anything that causes us to pay more attention or give more allegiance to those things than God, we have to be aware of. And we have to nail those to the cross, so to speak. You know, this is a very tough verse for me and maybe for some of us. Matthew 10, 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's a very difficult verse for some of us to swallow. But it's basically telling us that not our father, our mother, our sons, our daughters can be placed above God. God has to be first. There's another phrase in there, same song, that says, Hast thou dominion or self and or sin? That's pretty poetic. Dominion really just means rule or control. So he's telling us here that we have to have self-control, that we have to be able to establish our own behaviors and deny those sinful desires and temptations that we have. Do you have dominion over self and or sin? That's our goal. I don't know if all of us could answer yes all the time. Hopefully we can, but uh, that's our goal as Christians, to be able to have dominion over our sinful desires and to not do those anymore. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus himself said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So we have to deny a lot of these desires that come up, our temptations and whatnot, deny those and go a different route. And the last verse or the last phrase uh, that I wanted to explore a little bit is washed in the crimson flood. I wish I could talk that way. Don't you sometimes read some of these things and wish you could talk like they did? They were so elegant and the way they talked back in those days. Now we don't, we don't really pay that much attention to language. We just kind of say what we want to say. And we, in fact, come to the point where now we don't even have to say anything. We can use an emoticon or a little emoji or a, we don't really express ourselves the way people did back then. But the crimson flood, crimson, as you probably know, is very deep purplish red color. The crimson flood is describing the flow of Jesus' blood flowing down the cross of Calvary. And we are washed in the crimson flood. As we are baptized into Christ, that blood cleanses us from our sins. Look at Revelation 1.5 there. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So when we're thinking about is our heart right with God, we have to think about all of these things. Have our affections been nailed to the cross? Have we put God first in our lives? Have we accomplished dominion over self and or sin? Are we... Uh, checking ourselves daily to make sure that we're not sinning? And are we aware that we've been washed in the crimson flood? If so, then our heart should be right with God. And I hope that all of our hearts are right with God. All right, let me do some mathematics here. The bell just rang. We have uh, 25 songs to get through. We made it through 14. That's a little more than halfway there. So, uh, Victor is also going to be gone this Wednesday, and I didn't really think that I would be able to get through these, so uh, we can stop right where we're at there, and we can finish the rest of these on Wednesday. If you want to look ahead, you may, or you can just wait till Wednesday, and we will tackle the rest of these. But uh, as we're singing these, I hope that we can understand the meaning of them, and make the songs more meaningful to us as we sing them.
Thank you for your kind attention this morning, and we'll see you on Wednesday.